Welcome to this week's Into the Wilderness podcast. We have been all over the show over the last uh, few days and uh, weeks. Um, Just returned from London? Just returned from London. I've just done a tour of the whole of Scotland, (laughs) uh, which I'm absolutely shattered from. But it was good fun. We were showing our Norwegian friends what beautiful country we have. And uh, what's nice to see is that they were stunned by how beautiful it is. Despite the fact that their country is also awesome. Exactly. So I don't know if that's a compliment, saying that they thought the place wasn't going to be that amazing before <laughs> well, they, they came. thought it was going to be really or, shit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but they really enjoyed themselves. And the one thing they did highlight was actually how much we had to do here. That's so, good. That's yeah. nice. They said it's crazy how much you can do mm. in Scotland. Uh, and it's, it's true. We barely scratched the surface of what was possible yeah well you only had a few days yeah uh, four days yeah four days well we just uh come back as i said from london uh where we were at discovery channel hq interviewing mr lepson wood yes. what a guy incredible incredible i if you've never heard that name before just do us a favor because in two weeks time you're going to hear the interview that we did with him um and about his new series arabia with Levison Wood. But if you've never heard his name, go look him up and maybe try and watch some of the stuff he's done before that's online because it's going to blow you away. Uh, you could actually talk for a whole podcast just about one of his trips. Well, that was the problem yeah. because we're doing the, we're doing this interview. We're trying to give a bit of background for people who maybe don't know what he's done. And it became pretty apparent that we really needed one podcast for each one. <laughs> because yeah. the first 30 minutes, which was uh, sort of establishing who he is... It just touched the surface of stories that we knew in much more depth because we were had watched the, the series or whatever. If it was like Walking the Nile or we had read the book. And there's so many cool aspects of that where really we only just sort of brushed over what he had done. I can't also, if you actually look at it, I mean, he has done a lot throughout his whole life. But actually, if you look at the time frame of how much he's done in just the last 10 years. It, that's what I found incredible because it was so much of that was since he left the military. But equally, he was telling us when in the interview about quite a few things I didn't know he had done prior to joining the military, yes. which was really interesting because I hadn't, I hadn't seen that anywhere before. Yeah, so it was a nice nice trip down to uh, London. And I, don't, I don't know about nice. It was, it was <laughs> well, packed. Yeah, it was all right. Flybe managed to delay our flight by two hours to start with. Top tip, top tip for uh, from this trip. Don't fly Flybe. It's about the fourth time I've flown with them and... And I've not arrived. I either don't arrive, or I don't arrive on time, or I arrive on time with no luggage. <laughs> so that is... That's your choices. Take your pick. And this time, we de- we deliberately don't book Flybe, but this time there was no other option uh, because of timings from Aberdeen. And uh, yeah, we arrive at uh, five o'clock in the morning to see that it'd been delayed by two hours. So that was useful. Yeah, we, we got up before four. Oh. But anyway, the, the most important thing is that we arrived in time to do the interview. Yeah, we did. Which we did. And this was made possible by uh, by you good people. And yeah. we'll, we'll talk a, bit, a little bit more about that in a second. Absolutely. Well, we can talk about that now, I think, if we're done about London. Yeah. I, think yeah, I, I, I stayed an extra day and met up with uh, Mike Day, the man behind the incredible documentary, The Islands and the Whales. Which we've talked about on here. We have. And we had him, we've actually had him on, he reminded me that we've had him on twice because we had a proper like long interview with him. And then when the film actually released to the public, we had him on very briefly for like 20 minutes just to talk about what it was like. Was he talking about the cowboys in that one? He talked briefly about it. I actually saw a whole heap of that footage, uh, which was amazing. So he's working on a new, uh, well, a couple of new projects right now. Um, but I went to his studio in London and we were we were talking about some new projects that we we're going to be um, doing and I think he's probably going to be involved in. So very, yeah, very cool and nice to meet the man in person after speaking to him like over the phone for the last two years. I've met him in person. Oh yeah, you had, <laughs> yeah, I forgot about that because you went to go and see the premiere, didn't yeah. you? Well, for me, it was nice to meet him in yeah. person. Um, so yes, 
two weeks ago we mentioned, uh, well, we've got two really, uh, well, one new announcement today and one announcement which was from two weeks ago, which I'm going to remind everybody of, <clears throat> which was that we started a Patreon for the podcast, which is simply a way for people who enjoy the podcast to support us if you want. Uh, and we've got a couple of different tiers, like m monetary tiers and what you get in return. And uh, we've been amazed by the response. So thank you very much to every single person who has um, put some money towards the Patreon to help support the podcast and allow us to well, do things like we did this, uh, well, yes, two to London. days ago. Go to London to go and interview Levison Wood. That, that, first that interview may be possible over the, over the phone, but we don't like to do them. Uh, but certainly, because of the time, he has no time. He's Basically, so busy. the only way yeah. you could have done that was flying down there and getting that interview, and it's such a cool interview to get. Yeah, and it it pulls in a different audience as well. Yeah. You know, where so much of the stuff that we talk about is uh, you know fishing and hunting related, and it w it will always be that way. But as our regular listeners will know, we really really enjoy speaking to people who just adventure and live life. We've had Ed Stafford, Sean Conway. Uh, now Levison Wood, so that's very much part of the podcast too. Yeah, and uh, you will find out a bit more, but Levison is heavily involved in conservation charities. Yes, indeed. Uh, so the top two tiers in Patreon, so please go and check it out. Just look for Pace Brothers um, Into the Wilderness on Patreon. It'll come up if you just Google it, or the links are on our website. Uh, the or Pace in the Brothers. description. Yep thepacebrothers.com um, there's a bit of a revamp on the podcast page so it's looking um, sort of slick and clean now if you want to go and click that and have a look at some of the past episodes and new ones but the top two tiers for people who support Patreon uh, one of the things is that you get a shout out on the show so this yes. is the first time we've ever done this yeah it is so I have one, two, three, four five names to shout out um, Richard Stevens Richard McNeil uh, Chris Griffith uh, John Henry Pete. And lastly, uh, Ronnie Speakman and his company, rdcontracting.co.uk. Uh, and they are involved in... I, I, was gonna, I thought it was going to be one thing, but there's actually a whole heap of uh, different countryside contracting needs, everything from fencing to pest control. So you can go and check that out. Thank you very much to all of them for uh, hitting up the top two tiers to support the podcast. And thank you to everybody else um, who supports as well, who's not getting a shout out, but you're all appreciated. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You you, you all make up the, the awesomeness, which is this podcast. Uh, and your names will be in the description as well. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, even yeah, better. Yeah, and, and any links as well. Uh, with iTunes, sometimes there's a limit, so you, it might not always be there, but on every other platform, uh, sometimes iTunes pulls it. It's very complicated, this, this world of podcasting, but uh, yeah, it will be in regardless. And the big new announcement, which we've kind of been leading up to in the last couple of weeks, um, is that we have a new podcast supporter. A partner. Partner. A partner in this. Uh, and it's probably going to be no surprise when we mention who they are, because we do a lot of work with them anyway. Um, we write for them, um, actually editing for the, the new issue, and uh, we've become good friends with, with the editor, Tyler Sharp, over the last two years? Almost two years now? Yeah. Well, whenever the <laughs> Kickstarter yeah, was. exactly. So, yes, Modern Huntsmen are becoming a partner on the podcast. So they are uh, they are supporting us to help us bring you these shows, and uh, you know we've, as most of you will know, we have supported them uh, since day one because we really believed in the in in the narrative and the message that they're trying to get across. It's very much the kind of things that we talk about anyway, and uh, we, you know we've been involved since uh, well in terms of content within the, the publication we've been involved since volume two. I'd say we had a picture of volume one. Oh, we did. Yes, yeah. <laughs> on our Instagram. <laughs> yeah. So we're absolutely delighted to be officially um, partnering with Modern Huntsman. And, of course, Volume 3 has been printed now. Um, I think it's being bound, like, literally today or tomorrow. And the pre-orders have been coming in thick and fast. They have. Uh, so they're going to be shipping out 
imminently um, for everybody who has pre-ordered. And if you haven't pre-ordered, go ahead and do it. Uh, very, very soon, you're going to be seeing people on social media with the awesome Volume 3 in their hands, and then you're definitely going to want one <laughs> yeah. if you haven't ordered it already. We, we still have Volume 2s in the office. Um, so but they, it, the, the pile is reducing mm, quickly. It is, it is. So you just go and get your order in. And if you don't know what Modern Huntsman is, whether you hunt, fish, or don't, you need to go and check it out. So go and have a look at their website. Just Google Modern Huntsman. It's the first thing that comes up. And, and have a read of the ethos. But if you like these podcasts, you will 100% uh, like Modern Huntsman. And it is uh, worth every penny to get your hands on those publications and he, and read from really interesting and insightful people from around the world. And what we're going to be doing over the next, uh, the, the next few podcasts, well, actually probably f- for the rest of the year, is uh, periodically we're going to be bringing you, like a, in our intro, um, a brief snippet from one of the contributors telling you about the article that they've put in. Yeah, for volume so that's, three. that's pretty cool. And you have actually heard from some of the co- contributors who yes, are in have. volume three and who were in volume two, because by coincidence, more than anything else, uh, they, uh, they've they appeared on the podcast. So Charles Post is the ecology editor. He's been on. We had a fant- fantastic interview with him. Eduardo Garcia was in volume two. So he's been on recently. So there's a few people and some great crossovers there. And a podcast you haven't um, heard yet. Ben Speakman, was it? Ben? No. no. No, that's the wrong person completely. Yeah, no, I don't know who Ben Speakman is. Okay. Um, I, I don't know why that was in my head. Uh, who's left? There's um, Jack Evans' podcast is still to come out. And Jack, I, so that, I'm not sure when we're going to put that one out. Was, you've heard from Jack already because he was on uh, the podcast with Logan Young from the Bear Trust. But we have an entire podcast with Jack. And he uh, writes a fascinating uh, article in Volume 3, sort of centered around um, the grizzly bear debate. Yeah. Do we have anything else on today's list? Well, uh, you mean you I'll, need to, I'll need to introduce what this is? I don't think so. Because I've not listened to it yet. Huh. Yeah. So so thanks for, thanks for the support. Well, I will when this, this one goes out. <laughs> so uh, what we have done for this podcast, uh, if you remind, uh, remind yourself from... Uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, when I was out in Namibia, when I came back, I pointed everybody in the direction of a podcast that I was on uh, called Talk Nerdy, <clears throat> called Talk Nerdy with uh, Cara Santa Maria. Uh, it's a science based podcast, some really fascinating and intriguing guests on there. And it was a, a pleasure to be invited to talk about a subject which doesn't normally appear on that show. Uh, and we talked for, I don't know, an hour 45 uh, in Namibia in Vintuk at the CIC conference about all manner of things from elephant hunting to conservation to what hunting means to me, uh, to what we'd been doing at the conference. Uh, we talked about uh, community, uh, community ownership of uh, hunting and tourism concessions in Namibia, which we, we'd gone to visit. Um, so we really kind of thrashed that out, and I think she pulls some really interesting things out of me that I maybe haven't articulated on this podcast before. Uh, so very kindly, she's allowed us to use it on our show. So, But I would encourage you to go and listen to, uh, and I did say at the time, please go and listen to it and support uh, the fact that she had me on, on her podcast. So there's lots of other interesting guests on there, so please definitely go and check that out. Um, but for those of you who didn't go and do that, this is the interview that I did in Namibia. There you have it. So now you can... Well, even if you have listened to it, listen to it again on here. Yeah. Listen to it twice. Uh, I'm just trying to think. So we're... I'm actually... So I'm going away. I'm on holiday. Byron's going away. Yeah. So it's going to be a busy few few weeks. And uh, who's going to be then on the next show? I think it's going to be Levinson Wood. Uh, it has to be Levison yeah, Wood. Yeah, I think it because, is. Because uh, Levison Wood's show, uh, Arabia with Levison Wood, is out on the 27th of June on Discovery Channel, which is actually the day that the next podcast needs to go out. So I think what we're going to do is, uh, as we said to the guys um, at Discovery, is we'll probably put that podcast out a day early, just so, to remind everybody that the following night, instead of listening to our podcast, they need to go and, they need to go and uh, watch Levison. Well, you're in for a treat, 100%. Yeah, I uh, yeah no, it was an awesome awesome interview, and then I know that we have uh, Jack Evans still to come on, and then there's one or two more from the states left. I've also got um, uh, Alex from Namibia as yeah. well, when I was and then we him. have a Pangolin special. We do. I'm still working on that. Um, yeah, I'm going to try and get. I'll get that done before I go. Awesome, awesome. And lastly, 
the comp- it's not just one competition, two competitions for this week's podcast. We're, uh, we're phasing out one competition and, and then we're bringing, bringing in, another. in another one. So although the, the variety of items is being reduced, it's, it's, it's about quality, not quantity. So we have, uh, it, we're rolling over the one from two weeks ago, which was to win uh, a copy of the latest edition of the Hornady reloading manual, which is the same reloading manual that I use myself. I've used, I think I probably have the last three editions of the Hornady reloading manual at home. Um, but this is the latest that we've got. And because it is the last one that we're going to give away, um, I, I, we couldn't give it away just on one show. So we're rolling that over. And what we asked you two weeks ago was let us know where you buy your outdoors, hunting, fishing, or just general outdoors gear. Like, where's the shop that you like to go? That can be a physical place that you go, or it could be a shop online. Uh, we want to know from you where you go yeah. and who you like to use. So get in contact. And Mark. then we will randomly so I interrupt how you actually contact us, but uh, we will randomly select the winner. Yeah. Podcast at paceproductionsuk.com. There will also be a social media post, so you can just post and comment in the links underneath it so go and check that out on our um, on our facebook and it'll also be on the story on uh, on instagram i'll put that up again today so you can always um comment on the story and we'll save those down yes and now we have uh the new competition which is going to be i think pretty much running every show which, which is, is exciting yeah which is pretty cool uh which uh, as we said new partner modern huntsman but not only are they partnering and supporting us, they're giving you a chance to win a copy of the latest volume. That's awesome. That is. Yeah. Uh, I don't even have a copy. <laughs> <laughs> no one's got a copy yeah. yet because it hasn't landed. Um, so all you're going to have to do is just, uh, well, certainly for this one, it is going to be purely social. So you need to go and, you need to go and follow their page, Modern Huntsman. Go and follow ours, Pace Brothers. Uh, because that's where you will find the information for it. It'll be going up in the, in the next day or two. On Instagram. And on Instagram as well. Yeah. Um, the Facebook competition Instagram. Will, will be on both. Uh, it'll be like a social sharing or tagging a friend or something like that. Um, so just make sure you're following those accounts. Make sure you're following Modern Huntsman and us, Pace Brothers. And um, you'll see. Yeah. And then we'll randomly we'll, we'll randomly pick a winner. But we're going to be doing that or the every guy, two or weeks. Or the team in the States can pick a winner. Or, yeah, maybe they yeah. can for this one. Yeah. So good luck. And watch, watch out on online, on the line. Well, Byron, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me on. <laughs> Sorry, that's how I start all my episodes. A um, little awkward because we've been hanging out all day. So early on, I introduced um, where I am and, and why we're having this conversation, which is a little bit out of the norm, because usually when I'm recording, I'm sitting in my uh, very comfortable, very air-conditioned studio. Instead of a hot, sweaty hotel room yeah. <laughs> in Namibia. In Namibia, yeah. Usually I'm in Los Angeles, which is a little bit different. Um, so I've met you now, how many days ago? My brain is like totally frazzled from all the information we've taken on the last couple of days. But I think it was three days, isn't it? Three days, day yeah. Number three, I think. It's Friday. Yeah. So maybe on Wednesday. And you had been here in Africa for a while. You hadn't come straight from Scotland, had you? No, I came from Scotland, flew into Joburg, where my grandparents live. Um, I actually had some clients hunting down in the Eastern Cape, who I was just there kind of looking after, mm. just making sure they were happy. Uh, and then... I went on to spend some time with the African Pangolin Working Group and some of the research that they're doing. We raised uh, a bunch of money to provide some equipment on the ground for them, but I'd never seen a pangolin before. And actually, I'd never met the team. We just got to know them. It was a great cause. And every year through our company, we try and raise money for something related inside conservation. And, <laughs> and to be clear, for um, for the American ears on the podcast, you are saying pangolin, That's not pa- not penguin. No, no, definitely not a penguin. <laughs> okay, uh, I've actually never seen a penguin in the flesh, other than in the zoo. <laughs> really, you've no. never seen a penguin? Well, uh, not not in the wild. Really? No. Oh, interesting. I would love to, but no. You've pa- seen so pa- many wild animals, <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I've seen penguins. Yeah, I no. saw penguins in the Galapagos and in. Um, now you're just showing off. New Zealand, Australia, Australia. Phillips Island, mm. I think. They have like these these funny little blue I penguins. I saw quokkas in Australia, but oh. I didn't see any penguins. Quokkas are the best. But I have never seen a pangolin in like, the wild. So, so few people have. Yeah. And this is the crazy thing. It is the most trafficked mammal in the world. 
And yet, even people who live here... So there, there's four species in Asia, and there's four species in the continent of Africa. Mm. And even people who live there, here have barely seen them. I was speaking to my grandparents who have lived there, here, basically, their entire life. And I had stayed with them just the night before I went to go on the sort of five days with the guys from the Pangolin Working Group and telling them about it, showing them the pictures, and they had never even seen one. And is that because they are so critically endangered, or is it because they're also... Um you know, stay hidden away from view or is it a combination of the two? I think it's mainly because they're elusive. Mm -hmm. Because that even, even would be the word I was looking for. <laughs> even 50 years ago, people were not seeing them. So they're yeah. mainly nocturnal mm -hmm. uh, and they're just pretty secretive animals. And during the day, they'll find a burrow or a cave or somewhere to hide around in. And it just, they don't really make their presence known. It's not like they really make much noise. Although they are, when they're walking through like bushes and stuff, they've, they're pretty clumsy and they just kind of plow through things. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I was doing that before I came here. And then prior to, um, prior to this event in Namibia, I came out maybe a week before to spend some time uh, with a contact of mine just about three hours north of Windhoek, where he has um, a hunting not a concession, it's a farm, it's 30 plus thousand acres, it's privately owned. And they have hunting on one side of it, and they also have tourism on the other. So he's involved in sort of both sides of the tourism industry in Namibia. So I wanted to understand what uh, how he operated, what the comparison was between these two forms. And also he's involved in some really interesting projects to do with repopulating uh, certain species back into a new national park in the DRC, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. Mm. Uh, so I was intrigued to find out more about that. So all I knew at the point before meeting him was that this was happening. And now I have a much better understanding of it. And it was fascinating to, to meet him and the team and what they're doing there. So to unpack a little bit of what you said, even just here in this intro, um, you mentioned... I want to talk about pangolins, actually, for, for a minute before we get into no the problem, meat. No problem, so cool. Yeah, yeah, seriously. And I mean, at this point, I think people who have never heard the word pangolin have probably started to Google it. Unless you're in your car, don't do that. That's illegal. Um, and, and are learning more about what pangolins look like and maybe a little bit about their plight. But before we talk about that, you mentioned that you had clients in South Africa, mm -hmm. hunting clients. Yeah, they were, yeah. So... You know, I introduced you as a filmmaker. How, how, what is a hunting Filmmaking client? to hunting. So, yeah. I mean, I have, I have always hunted in some form ever mm -hmm. since being a little kid. I, I suppose actually the first form of, uh, people who fish don't like me to say this, but the first form of hunting I did was actually fishing. Okay. Uh, I kind of see it as the same thing. You're, right, you're hunting with a meat. rod. You're yeah. still... Uh, you're still pitting your wit against a wild animal. So Some people spearfish. They spearfish, yeah. Yes, okay, so that's that was, very hunty. That, that's that's very more hunty. Yeah. Right? But I, I have spearfished, but only a little bit, and mm -hmm. much later in life. So most my early experiences were fishing for pike in the Highlands of Scotland, mm -hmm. and then uh, hunting for rabbits with my dad. Um, so I've grown up within sort of hunting circles. Uh, to give you an idea of my sort of position in hunting now and how I use it at home, about 80 to 90% of all the meat that's in my freezer, I've killed myself hmm. or has been given to me by other friends who hunt or sometimes uh, a local estates, which I don't know if a state really translates in the States. Um, like, like a homestead? Like something some Yeah, owns? it's more like a ranch. Okay, sure. Yeah, so we're talking, the one that I have in my mind where I buy carcasses from, uh, like deer carcasses. Mm -hmm. It's 50 plus thousand acres, mm -hmm. so it's fairly big. Uh, and through their management system of deer, they put a lot of game meat into the food chain through game dealers, and I go and buy carcasses from them. So uh, it's wild game that I eat, and that's what I use most of my sort of hunting knowledge and ability for. So when you say 80 to 90% of what's in your freezer mm. is um, is hunted, is 80 to 90% of your diet game? Or do you still eat, you know, pork and oh, no, I, chicken I do. and beef? Um, I mean, I eat a bit of, uh, you know, a bit of lamb, a bit of beef. Oh, lamb. Yeah, that's a thing, right? Yeah. People don't eat much lamb in the US, I don't think. No, it's not really a thing. No. Mm -mm. Interestingly, I don't know whether it's just because of my background in uh, understanding the full connection with food mm -hmm. and being 100% responsible for so much of my food. But even when it comes to livestock, I actually end up sourcing quite a lot of that myself as well. Mm -hmm. So I have a lot of uh, farmer friends, some of whom, whose farms I also hunt on. And uh, you know, very often I'll buy a sheep off them. Yeah. So I buy a sheep off and then do all the butchering myself and then put it in the 
put it in the freezer. So it's quite funny. There's... But I do go. I do use the shops. Yeah. I'm not a total hillbilly. <laughs> <laughs> there's this kind of stereotype, I think, of hunters, and of course, we'll, we'll be diving into this much more as well. But there's, I think, there's this kind of stereotype of hunters as these very like rugged, manly men who are. Um... I like to think of myself as a rugged manly man. <laughs> <laughs> and who are also maybe like a bit, um, I don't know, not terribly progressive politically. And I think when you look at, uh, there's a show that used to be on the air in the United States and I'm fucking blanking on the Alaska name. people. Or no, no, no. I'm actually thinking of something that's quite, quite the opposite. It's to put a bird on it show, Portlandia, okay. which is the show about like total hipster Portland Hipsters, like very progressive uh, okay, liberal hipsters. Yeah. But there's a very famous episode where they go to sit down at a restaurant and they want to order this free range chicken. And they're like asking so many questions about the chicken that finally they're like, I just I need to meet where this chicken came from myself. <laughs> In fact, I need to meet the chicken. Yeah. And so they get up from the table and they take a drive to this local you know, farm and they, they, they start meeting the chicken because, of course, it's so important to them that they are really, I think, um, intimately familiar with where their food came from. And it's so funny that in some ways that kind of comes full circle, that there's, I think, much more connection um, between this, what we think of in the U.S. as this sort of lefty, um, liberal view about food and what we think of as often a very conservative and kind of uh, aggressive, maybe testosterone-laden view of food. They're not so far apart. There's so much common ground there. Yeah. And one of, to me, one of the most interesting changes in the hunting world has come from that sort of hipster side of it. Yeah. Where there's this intrigue in food and, uh, and a, a real will to understand where it comes from. And that is, I mean, we can talk about the trophy hunting aspect. I'm sure we'll probably get onto that. Mm. But if you're just looking at it from a food point of view, which is a lot of the reason that a lot of people hunt, especially in North America, uh, it is for food or it certainly is a byproduct of it. Yeah. Uh, and, it's hard to get a better appreciation of uh, your interaction with the animals that you consume than by hunting it. Oh, absolutely. I think the vast majority of us in the United States are incredibly removed from our food. You know, we're Not eating... just states. I mean, I think the world over yeah. is a bit... So Especially good. the Western world. Yeah, it's so urbanized. Sure. I mean, we're eating, you know, highly processed food. We're eating food that no longer even, I think, um, visually represents the animal that it came from. Importantly, doesn't visualize mm -hmm. it. Because I think if, if you visualized it more in terms of packaging, I think I put a lot of people off now. Uh, oh, absolutely. And even not just the packaging, but the, the, the way that we eat, you know, chicken, we eat it in breast form or mm. it's, um, it's chopped and processed and like made into nuggets, you know, it's not no longer on the bone. It no longer looks like the anatomy of the animal. And in some ways, I think that's what makes it more appealing to many people. Um, but it, it does make us very far away from our food. So when we try to think about ethical issues, um, especially with regards to things like factory farming and treatment of animals, um, we'd just rather not think about it. And it's the it, easy option. Of course. Not to think about it because to really, to really tackle those problems you have to think about it in every aspect of your life. So it means that if you're eating out, like the example that you just gave, mm -hmm. you know, really, if you're trying to be environmentally responsible and you care about all animal welfare, whether that be livestock or wildlife, you should always be asking the questions. So for me, like one of the questions that I always ask at home in Scotland, uh, if I'm, if I'm eating out, which isn't all that often is I love eating salmon. I love fishing for salmon, actually. But I don't eat it at all anymore. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is because of the issues that we have with salmon farming, which are somewhat parallel to the issues with salmon farming in North America. And the uh, cause and effect between salmon farming and our, our wild stocks of salmon and sea trout. And at the mo this moment in time, it's not possible for me to say, okay, salmon farmed from this particular farm in this sea lock are not having a negative impact on the wild stocks. And so my answer to that is that I, I just won't eat it in the hope that if more people would do that, and, yeah. and I talk about it, you know, we've talked about it on the podcast, it's not just a solitary, uh, a solitary stance. That's, that's kind of silly, mm -hmm. uh, if, especially if you're trying to change something, is that if more people do that, then the companies will listen to the consumers because they're no longer buying it. And that's a, uh, a conscious choice because I'm not happy not only with their impact on the environment and the other species that share it, mm -hmm. but also because of the animal welfare within those fish farms. Yeah. So that's it, it's a small example 
Um, but I think if people thought about these things a little bit more, the same is true of beef, the same is true of pork, then we'd probably facilitate more change. I wonder how many people who are listening to the show right now, because the the vast majority of my listeners are in the U.S. I think the next largest population is in the U.K., then Australia, then South Africa, and then moving on to kind of non-English speaking countries. Although I do have listeners all over the world. I think I recently saw that I had listeners in Saudi, which welcome Saudi listeners. Um, but I'm wondering how many and within the U.S., when you break down by city, it's New York and, and Los Angeles, which mm -hmm. are the two largest cities. And I wonder how many people are um, taken aback or, or maybe a little bit surprised to hear um, a hunter talking in this way about... Well, do you think that's not normal? I think it's probably very normal. And I think, you very, think it is? very yeah. many people don't know that that's oh, normal. Okay. You know? and, and I think that's part of why it was so important to me that while we were here, while I'm here, that I had a chance to be able to talk to you on the show. So what I tend to do on the show, which I, I'm guilty of doing right now, is diving headfirst into the deep end with zero context. So okay. I want to take a second to... Because yeah, we were talking about the hunting clients, but we've already ended up on a massive tangent. Yeah. We're talking about salmon now. We were in South Africa a minute ago. I love it, though. I love it. And <laughs> it's I exactly the same for us. Don't worry. <laughs> I think it is important, too, for to, to be able to have these kinds of conversations and, and allow them to meander. But fuck, I think I got bit by something on my <laughs> elbow. It's if you've like, only been bitten once while you're here, you're doing know, well. I've got I, like three on my leg, two on my back, one under my arm. And I've not worn bug spray once. No deet. The this first is, night we were here, yeah. in like in this hotel complex, I was at war with a mosquito for the entire <laughs> night. Eventually, I hid underneath that one sheet because it was too hot for the duvet. They like just pulled it over and clamped down and just, I could hear him buzzing around and I had given up trying to kill him. I told you, you should have turned on your air conditioner, but you refused. My air conditioner conditioning didn't work. There was no remote control in my room for the air conditioner. We won't have that conversation no, on air. Um, so, so kind of rewinding a bit to, to get a bit more context. Part of the reason that I was so interested in speaking to you is that you are a filmmaker who focuses quite a bit on wildlife and conservation. The conference that we are here attending, I was, I was invited to speak at a very um, different conference than I would, I think, usually be invited to speak at. Because the context was communicating, like communicating science and communicating scientific principles. They translate so readily to the principles, the core principles that are being discussed at this conference. So tell me a little bit um, and the listeners a little bit like from your perspective, what is the CIC? What is this conference that's going on right now? And why are we here? Council for International Conservation. Mm -hmm. Why are we here? What is an, I, think, I think what was amazing about uh, the sessions that we were in. Which was, was it, kind of like a journalism. Yeah, it was like a symposium, symposium. before the main sort of mm -hmm. council event, which we've been sat in um, today, which was a, a series of speeches and discussions about the state. Well, t today particularly was the state of wildlife and wildlife conservation in Africa with a focus on hunting and its role within these sort of management principles mm -hmm. and the, the issues that they face globally in contextualizing that to a wider public and why it's important. Because as most people will be aware, as I'm sure almost all of your listeners, that there's a lot of controversy when it comes to hunting in Africa, particularly uh, big game. Like Absolutely. Your elephants and lion. Uh, it's been well publicized in the papers. Mm. So I think we, we were here. I was actually at the first symposium in Switzerland uh, three years ago. And the topic then was the future of hunting. You know, what is the future of hunting? And if you are somebody who believes in hunting um, as a tool and a, as part of uh, heritage and, and culture within certain countries, it was becoming quite apparent, or it has become quite apparent over the last few years, that it's increasingly under threat of being shut down, as we've seen, particularly in Africa, most of the hunting shut down in Botswana. Yeah. And does this matter? Is it important? And is, is, is it important to people? And is it important to wildlife? So we were kind of discussing that um, three years ago. I wasn't at the one last year. And then uh, this year... I think they've called it Crossroads, haven't they? Uh, so Something this is sort like of the wildlife at a crossroads. Yeah. Or, so yeah. The, the crossroad point of um, it's still really tied to the, the future of hunting and its relevance and importance. And is it important in the future of wildlife management? And from my perspective, what was really great in the symposium, which happened the day before the main conference started, was actually having people like you and Jason and the, the journalists from Austria in the room. Mm -hmm able to converse and discuss in an open-minded manner 
and ask us questions as the hunting community that we maybe don't want to tackle ourselves. Because I sure. think it allows us to rationalize arguments mm -hmm. in a far better way when you're not having internal discussions. Yeah, when you're not sort of in the echo chamber yeah, or maybe not, preaching Yeah, to you're the not choir. slapping each other on the back because mm -hmm. you kind of all know you're using the same terminology all the time. But when you have someone from a science background who is genuinely inquisitive and wants to listen and learn, that was incredibly valuable. And I think that actually was the and is the main purpose of those symposiums. It is to try and generate discussion in a way that possibly hasn't been had before so that we can come uh, to a consensus as to the actions which need to be taken for the future. Mm -hmm. uh, and what I was always trying to bring it back to in the discussion that we had on the first day was that whatever we do, it has to be centered around the wildlife. And that has to come first. But obviously, we understand from the complexities of discussions that we had that that involves so many moving parts. And, and critically, it involves the people in the countries living in the same environment as that wildlife. So I, you know, I think coming into this, I didn't know what to expect. I didn't really... <sighs> I mean, I probably had tons of, of preconceived notions, but I tried to come into it with as open mind as possible. But I will say that when my friends and family asked me what I was going to Namibia for, I told them I was I was coming to a conservation conference, which is not untrue, but I no. never mentioned the word hunting um, solely because I think that many questions would be raised that I wasn't sure how to answer. And, because you um, didn't think you had the, the background or tools to answer? Well, and I think that the these uh, sort of stigma, the stereotypes mm -hmm. were, were so heavy that I wouldn't really know how to engage at that point in time. And it became increasingly apparent to me as I was sitting and listening to um, these incredibly knowledgeable people speak, and especially yesterday when we took a kind of a day trip to uh, a conservancy up north, um, it became increasingly apparent to me why it's so critically important to have these conversations, which is why ultimately I wanted to have you on the show. So to kind of take a step back... Um, I was taking some notes today during some of the uh, panels, and one of the things that one of the women mentioned when we were listening earlier was this idea that the first question that everybody asks, because I, I want to take it back to the kind of most naive listener who sees hunting as diametrically opposed to conservation or who has never heard of hunting in the same sentence as conservation. I'm going to take it all the way back to this conversation where you say, okay, we're looking at the numbers and we see that on the whole, and we'll talk about how this is not the case region to region and country to country, but on the whole, wildlife is declining at an alarming rate. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. And, and then you say, okay, wildlife is declining at an alarming rate. So what should we do? We should stop and sh you know, we should make sure wildlife is not killed. Yeah. And then you say, okay, we make sure wildlife is not killed. And then all of a sudden, there are all of these downstream effects that we never thought of from our comfortable homes in the United States and in the United Kingdom. We start to see all of this human-wildlife conflict in these um, areas where individuals live in direct um, connection with wildlife. And we start to see that there are massive economic impacts um, when all of a sudden no wildlife is 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 harmed or, or killed anymore. And, and the question starts to become, why do I keep hearing about hunting? Why is it that boots on the ground, which I would never have known if I hadn't come here in person and sat and spoken with people who run conservancies and people who work for the Namibian government um, on critical conservation efforts? I would never have known that hunting is like a massive part of that conversation. Mm -hmm. So that's really the crux of what I want to talk with you about as a person who wears the hat of a, of a kind of a Scottish traditionalist hunter and also the hat of a very modern, very progressive conservationist. And you know very intimately that these two things kind of cannot exist without one another. But I think very few people know that across the world. Yeah, it's um, it's, it seems like a contradiction. Absolutely. The, the idea I think to most that you would kill is. wildlife mm -hmm. to save it. It's important to first of all say that that is not 
always necessary or the case. Sure. And I think that's something that the hunting community have been guilty of is they, you know, they hunt to conserve. Shoot to save. Shoot to save. It's, and in quite an aggressive manner as well. Not really wi uh, willing to listen and engage with the outside world uh, because we're right. You know, and we've always been right. <laughs> yeah. and it's we don't just, want to be wrong. Yeah. And it's just a shame that no one else understands us. <laughs> and that's just silly. That's just, I think that's a lot of the reason that we have the problem that we have yeah. now when trying to explain uh, hunting as a management tool for conservation Sure, is that It, you know, this has been going on for a very, very long time. In What, hunting or conservation or both? Uh, well, both. But yeah. hunting as a, for, as a tool for conservation a tool. Has, mm -hmm. been, has been going on for decades and decades. Um, but we never really talked about it. We just kind of just got on with it. Yeah. Uh, and didn't feel the need to discuss it. But we live in very different times now uh, where people, I think, are more curious. Uh, they want to understand what is going on in the world and how resources are being used because uh, we are becoming more environmentally conscious, even if we're not necessarily acting environmentally conscious. Sure. And so when you tell somebody that uh, Botswana, for example, the conference that's happening as we record this podcast, want to reopen elephant hunting, it becomes quite a hard thing to understand because, as we all know, elephants are endangered, aren't they? Right. And, and as we all know, it's, it's, um, it's fundamentally inhumane to kill an elephant. Yeah. Or, or, you know, questionably any other animal, mm -hmm. depending on which side of the fence you sit on. But if you look at, and I am no expert on the Botswana situation, but I have an overview. I have a grasp of the situation there. They closed uh, pretty much all the hunting a couple of years back, but they have a very, very high elephant population. And the problem with a very, very high elephant population, or indeed population of any animal, so I'm going to draw some comparisons now with Scotland, which is my home country, and one hopefully listeners can maybe grasp a little bit better than an elephant, is that if we don't manage, so we have no natural predators for deer in Scotland or in the UK, uh, elephant also have no natural predators. Mm -hmm. There, There is, I think, a pride of lions somewhere in Africa that have worked out how to take down small elephants, but that is not the norm. Yeah. Uh, so the only real predator they have is man. If we don't manage the populations of deer in the highlands of Scotland, they have detrimental impacts on the ecosystem they live in, the Heather Merland, which then has a whole chain effect to everything else that shares that environment with them. Yeah, this is also the case in the United States. This is, I think, one of the central reasons that I grew up in Texas hunting deer with my family. Okay, yeah. There were too many deer. And it was important from an ecological perspective. I mean, we also like to eat deer and we also like to... We enjoyed hunting growing up, but there it was important from an ecological perspective to maintain the deer population at a at a level that um, was consistent with the carrying capacity of the land. Exactly, and that's the key. Mm. Uh, so, if you look at the elephant situation in Botswana, even when I was there ten years ago hunting in the Caprivi, uh, which is just a narrow strip of Namibia on the other side from the Botswana border, you could see even then the elephant destruction. They're a very, very destructive animal to have. I mean, they're, they're huge. And when you say destruction, you know, I think the first thing people think is like, how could they destroy their own habitat? Which but is what a fair you're comment. But what you're talking about is destruction of agricultural land, destruction of human um, Actually, I'm not. dwellings. What no, are you talking about? I mean, about? that does exist. Mm -hmm. So that is more the wildlife conflict with humans. Sure. When, when I was referring to um, elephant destruction, it was just in terms of their own environment. Because and there's too the, many of them. Yeah. And the other species that share that. Sure. So, so they'll eat everything within And they knock down sight. every tree. Mm -hmm. And so if, well, if to, to, paint, to paint the picture, I'm, I'm sitting for the first time. I'd never been to the Caprivi. I'm 20 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, the most incredible place. I'm watching elephant over the river on this uh, lush island. And there's, you can, the grass is up to their armpits and they're eating away and it's awesome and there's sounds and there's hippo and you can hear lion you look over onto the other side so i was on the namibian side which uh, as you've you've gathered well we've been here uh, as a country manages their wildlife very well mm -hmm. especially by comparison to some uh, other african countries and they really have a grasp on uh, the quota systems and the conservancies so up there they were giving quotas uh, by survey every year for uh, the number of hippo and crocodile and elephants buffalo and everything else that could be hunted within those conservancies to make sure that it was a sustainable offtake so that means in an effort to ensure that 
not so many are hunted that it is damaging to the population, but enough are hunted that the population doesn't grow too large in size. Exactly. And... uh, I mean, we can talk. We can expand on this later, but mm-hmm. there was all the the economic benefits to the local communities, well as well, and they had systems in place where you had to employ uh, one of the local rangers who was with you the whole time, and all the meat from those particular hunts that I was on went to local communities, and we were there helping them cut it. It was the most. I've got some really great pictures of them all cutting up these these hippo that were essentially the the meat is given to the uh, the local villagers and just. Like within a matter of hour of it being put up onto the bank, there's like a hundred people there, mm. all getting there. They and they had this amazing way. I didn't fully understand how they shared out the meat. I mean, that's another story. But so that there was no kind of infighting. Everybody. Yeah, they, they must have had a hierarchy for it. Yeah. But I didn't quite grasp because I didn't speak the language. I didn't quite grasp how that worked. But there was a very clear hierarchy yeah. of how the meat <laughs> was distributed. Uh, and it's something I would love to learn, you know, more about, and I will when I when I have the opportunity again. But to, going back to the elephants, when you looked across to the Botswana side, even then, you could see that it wasn't the same lush green mm-hmm. environment that was supporting masses of wildlife as on the Namibian side. And that situation, since they banned elephant hunting there, has only got worse. Yeah. And that is paralleled, uh, maybe a place that more people will be familiar with, Kruger National Park. You know, Probably beside Yellowstone, one of the most famous national parks in the world, uh, a lot of people don't know that they have a serious elephant problem. But they don't really want to tackle the issue mm-hmm. because the issue is very unpalatable. And that is that Kruger National Park has too many elephants, they are negative, they have begun to negatively impact the environment that they live in, which is not good for them, and it's not good for the sable and the impala and the uh, the roan and, and every other antelope that needs to eat from that mm-hmm. ecosystem. And we haven't even started to talk about all the small little bugs and lizards and stuff that most mm-hmm. people don't really care about. Sure. Um, so, what, so what do you do about that? So you can... You really only have two choices. You either cull a population. And that means to literally go out and and kill these animals and either let them kind of rot in place or incinerate them. No, that almost never happens. So they do feed them to the local communities when they cull. 100%. I I personally do not know of an instance... Mm. Uh, where that has ever happened. Now, obviously, I'm not saying that has never happened because that's... A and you're saying thing. that specifically for countries on the African continent? I mean, globally. I mean, I... I can tell you that culling of deer in, in um, America does not result in, in feeding the population. No, but it will... Th- but they're not left in the field. Sh- I'm just making, uh, that, I'm sure, just, sure. I'm just making that distinction. But that, oftentimes they are incinerated. I, I don't know. If yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, simply because there's not as much of a taste, I think, for really? the game meat. But is that not because in North America you can't sell game meat? You're right. There are a lot of political okay. uh, implications there as well. So yeah. we, um, and I'll revert back to the elephants now, but mm-hmm. uh, so we can sell game meat from the wild. So it doesn't have to be farmed to be able to sell it into our food chain in the UK. Yeah. So all of this surplus, so say uh, on the estate by us, they're taking out, say, 400 females in a year to balance the population with habitat impact. Uh, the vast majority of that is going to a game dealer, and the game dealer is processing that, and it goes into the food chain in either local butchers or in our supermarkets. Um, so there's nothing being left in the field ju- just because you need to reduce the population for the environmental impact. There's a, there's a full circle of usage yeah. here. It, it reduces, I mean, I guess, I don't know if waste is the right word, but it, it, it does raise a question, which I think is a fundamental one, probably for the people listening, which is what is the difference between culling and hunting? It can be the same thing. Okay. So what, let's focus on the elephant issue. So sure. what... Uh, would I am the ideal situation there would be uh, the Botswana government through their wildlife departments uh, departments say we need to cull X number of elephants to reinst- reinstate the balance between the environment and their population. We haven't talked about the potential of actually moving animals, but we can you know we can Absolutely. deal with that relocating, which is a big thing here. And I can give you a great. Well, I mentioned it at the start with the, the moving of animals to the DRC. Mm. Um, but let's just assume that's off the table because no one else wants no one else wants the elephants. Yeah, let, or let's say that there's economically. Yeah, so that's just we can't afford to move. So them. we're yeah. going to cull them. The best case scenario for that 
is instead of having a government employed uh, personal ranges or multiple people, if it's you're talking about hundreds of elephants, which they will be, mm. uh, going out and just simply shooting the elephants in the most efficient manner possible, and then processing the meat or giving the meat to the i mean the, the in africa meat gets processed if mm. if people if local people know that there's meat they yeah. will come and they will process it so, so it's not even like it's a big logistic operation really you could do that but what do you get out of it what you get out of that is you get a redressing of the balance mm. and you provide meat to the local community but what if you could bring in hunters which largely speaking would be foreign hunters because that tends to be where the money is who would pay to do exactly the same job the same animals being selected would be shot but they also inject hundreds of thousands of dollars into the economy and and the local areas what is the better scenario in that situation if you accept that it has to happen I would rather see, irrespective, and this is where the conversation gets muddied. Mm. So irrespective of the motivations of, of the, the people, of the hunters, mm. because that's a whole separate discussion. Yeah. Let's just put that in a little box for now. Yeah, we'll come back to yeah, it. Yeah, we'll come back to it. So irrespective of their motivations, I'd rather have them in the country shooting the elephants under guidance. It's not like it's free for all. Yeah. They're there with professional hunters and the rangers and with everyone else. With a permit issued by the government. 100%. It's Having all legal. Paying loads of money you're talking about this. you know per elephant tens of thousands of dollars yeah so uh, and that's just for the animal yeah think that's, about all the other ways they're infusing the economy yeah, that's visiting. not including accommodation that's yeah. not including government taxes that's not including uh the hiring of trackers you know there, there's a, a lot of economic yeah. spin the hiring of a lot of local people to exactly. engage in this yeah. i'd rather see that option because it seems wasteful not to use that and the way you're talking about this, it's not a hypothetical. This is something that happens in many African countries. Oh, yeah. And this is to, I think, the Western ears that are listening to this right now, what we refer to or historically have referred to as trophy hunting. Yeah, that's what the, that would be the term. Yeah. Um, now there are efforts to kind of re, rebrand and maybe call it <laughs> conservation hunting. Yeah, well, but, we, well, we heard that from the mm -hmm. actually, and that's not a... That term has come from this local community mm -hmm. in Namibia up north. That's uh, that was the first time I'd heard that, to be honest. And the interesting thing is, I mean, it, it, it's smart. Obviously, it's referring to the exact same process. Yeah. But it, 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 in a way, I think it's very smart, um, very kind of savvy marketing, because when because these local people in these local conservancies know that when certain people in the West hear the phrase trophy hunting, it's, it's very negative, palatable to them. Yeah. Because they don't understand the realities of the economic issues on the ground. And they don't understand the realities of the um, ecological issues on the ground. And I mean, we, we touched on it, but we skipped past it. There's also the, the, animal, uh, the, the wildlife-human conflict. Absolutely, which well. we haven't really gotten which into is, at all. And it's so important to consider that because if you don't give enough weight to the effect of people who live with the wildlife. And it doesn't have to be elephants. You know, mm -hmm. we can be talking about deer in the highlands because it's, a, it's paralleled with the crofts, like on the, on the Isle of Skye all the time. A friend of mine who's a gamekeeper, a stalker up there, uh, I wonder if I should clarify those terms. So gamekeeper, like ranger. Like a park custodian, ranger. Like, mm, kind of, but for a, like an estate, for a ranch. Okay. Uh, so we use the gamekeeper, stalker, kind of interchangeably. Stalker just being a hunter, but it's a, it's a term that they use there as a, a hunter, like a guide. So a gamekeeper is somebody who's kind of responsible for ensuring the, um, the numbers and the health and the kind of general... Um, I don't know. General. They're looking after the... They tend to be looking after all of the, the hunting concerns in an area. Okay. But if they also, uh, this is the complication, if they also hunt deer, then they're known as a stalker. Right. And, and stalker, I mean, that sounds super fucking creepy. <laughs> it does a bit, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. But what you're when actually I said it talking to, it's about. It's a Tyler for the first time. He's like, I think we need to clarify yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so stalker meaning that in an effort to be an effective hunter. Yeah, exactly. Because you're stalking your prey. Yeah. Well, that's where you, it comes from. You literally are, are learning how the prey, you yeah. know, how they, how they live. Yeah. Where do I and find you them? you are a hunter. Yeah. So you are stalking your prey. You but are a, a, much like a, a 
predator. Like any predator would yeah, do, yeah. yeah. So there they have the issue of uh, crofters, which are like small holdings. Okay, uh, that's, I'm very, crafter? No, crofter. Crofter. So you yeah. are saying crofter. Yeah, croft. This is it's, not a word I know. It's a historic, um, I am not that well versed in this, although I have been around it a lot in the Isle of Skye where it's, it's pretty evident. Um, and it's, you see it still up and down the west coast of Scotland. And they were essentially small holdings where people had a very small amount of livestock, largely for subsistence and a bit of trade. Okay. But we're talking back like hundreds of years in the history of Scotland. There used to be crofts everywhere, um, but there isn't now. Now it's much more large-scale agriculture. But where they do still exist, they have wildlife conflict there too, mm-hmm. where uh, this one friend of mine who's the, the head stalker up on uh, a galax speaking estate on the Isle of Skye, uh, he has them phoning all the time saying, the deer are in my garden. Or the deer are in my paddock, which could be you know thirty acres, eating my grass. Yeah. Uh, but they're your deer. Uh, you need to come and do something about it. Now that's not too dissimilar to the elephants have knocked over my fence, or they're eating my trees that, or they're eating my grazing that my goats want to eat here. Yeah, and you it's see it more destructive. Sure, but, it's, but you can see the parallels. But you there. see it in the U.S. too, even with predators. Um, you know, we, we heard today a story about a, a lion that ate. A small child, mm. and the and, and imagine the heartache and the frustration and the the difficulty of the local people who, you know, periodically do lose their own to more dogs, yeah, yeah, pets yeah, or pets, um, and you know, you think to. Los Angeles and people losing their pets to coyotes. Mm-hmm. Um, you think farmers losing their alpaca to mountain lions. It's it's not any. Or, or, it's still a conflict. Yeah, absolutely. It's still a wildlife conflict. Absolutely. And we, and it's funny because we think about the way that we manage those things in the U.S., that these farmers, for example, um, are often given permission to, um, to hunt a predator that is threatening their livestock. Um, and people are like, yeah, okay. Hmm. Sometimes people get up in arms about it. Um, I think the same kind of controversy exists there. But then we think of... Individuals who are living oftentimes in poverty mm-hmm. in incredibly rural areas um, that are surrounded by. And this was reinforced to us so many times yesterday when we were visiting this conservancy in the north. And I keep calling it this conservancy in the north because the name is literally unpronounceable. I can't pronounce it. I, I looked at it just before coming in here and I still couldn't quite. Yeah, when, it together, we, so. when we asked our guide how it's, to pronounce it's near it. near Atosha. Yeah, so it's near Atosha. Yeah. Uh-huh. And, and when we asked our guide how to pronounce it, she said, don't try. Um, <laughs> because the, the local language is a click language. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and it's very difficult. Um, so we would definitely butcher it. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so this conservancy in the north, um, they kept reiterating, and I think that this is kind of in many ways the Namibian way, that these conservancies are not fenced areas. These are people living in the same region by choice because they care to be shepherds of, of the wildlife. And they use that term, which I really liked, mm-hmm. actually, shepherds. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and they, they, they choose to live near to these magnificent creatures that are also incredibly powerful, knowing that there's a risk. But that risk, have, that risk has to be offset. And this, this is the, the consideration that we always need to think about, mm-hmm. is that where you have uh, wildlife conflict with humans, if you don't give the wildlife a value to those local people, then the wildlife will no longer exist there. And it won't exist because they will eventually take matters into their own hands. The wildlife has to be worth more alive to them. It's, and it's compounded here in Africa where there is poverty and people are hungry. Mm-hmm. It'll just disappear. It'll disappear because they, um, and, and I want to be very clear about differentiating terms here. Uh, they will kill it illegally because it won't be under a permit system and they will poison it. They will do something. And there's loads and loads of evidence to show this. Yeah. And to some extent, you can't blame them. No, I, I mean, I think that that's the first thing that many people would raise is this question of like, who am I yeah. to tell somebody tens of thousands of miles from home yeah. what they can do in their backyard when I have no concept no, of you, what it's like to live amongst lions probably and never hyenas been there. and never elephants? Seen it. No, I mean, you're pe- like in Scotland, people are pissed because a, a deer's in their back garden. So what happens if an elephant walks over and destroys your entire crop, which is how you're supposed to survive next year? And drinks all of your water that yeah. you've had stockpiled and potentially threatens the safety of your children. Yeah. So, th- so this is where 
uh, hunting in Africa in particular uh, in this very visceral way where we're looking at l quite literally life and death plays a really crucial role where the communities are able to uh, put value on keeping wildlife rather than it being a problem to them because they know that it's a, a real asset and a valuable asset where there can be compensation for crop damage, where there can be compensation for fences being knocked over, where they are comfortable living in those situations because they know that in the long term, they're going to see a greater economic benefit to their areas. If they don't have that incentive, it just disappears. And, and we've seen that time and time again. You can, I mean, Kenya, I almost don't want to use the Kenya example because it's used so often, but it's a very easy example for me to use. Kenya has an awesome wildlife, but it's in very small areas. I mean, relatively speaking to the, they're huge areas, relatively speaking to the entire country. But they've lost masses and masses of their wildlife since they banned hunting in the 1970s. So where it's protected, where it's a park, where the tourists go, it's great. But what about the rest of the country? Well, most of the rest of the country now is used for cattle farms because the wildlife was worth more dead yeah. than it was alive because it was competition. And that's both lion competition for actually eating cattle and also just grazing pressure. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be a predator. And we forget that. You know, we're so detached from it because most people have experienced it on that level before. Absolutely. I mean, the... <laughs> People are trying to imagine and make ethical, moral distinctions based on a gut reaction to something that they're very emotionally triggered by without really understanding um, the nuance because they just don't have that insight. And, and why should they? Because they've never been to those places and, and the information, unfortunately, by in many cases, the local and the international media um, simply isn't translated appropriately. And I think that the statement that you made about these things being in this situation where hunting has been banned, being worth more dead than alive is, is a really important one that bears repeating. And I think it comes down something that was mentioned today that, that uh, I wrote down in my notes, uh, that this really is a fundamental human rights issue as well. And um I've noticed now that we've been talking for 45 minutes, so I want to take a quick break because I think we need to thank the sponsors of the show right now. But hold that thought because I would like to explore um, explore that concept in a little bit more detail when we return right after this break with Byron Pace. All right, we are back um, with Byron Pace. We're sitting here in a hotel room in Windhoek, Namibia, talking about wildlife conservation in Africa and the world and kind of across the world as a whole. Um, and specifically within the context of its relationship to trophy hunting. Um, something that I think prior to this trip, I was probably like most of you listening, appalled by, you know, I did Just not... Just the notion of it. Yeah, I did not have any concept. When I think of a trophy hunter, I think of a rich American who has a hunger for flesh, um, who has like a small dick... <laughs> And is very interested in proving to the world that it's much larger than it is. Um, is he probably fat as well? He might be. <laughs> um, we think often of people killing things from helicopters or from the backs of Jeeps. And yeah. we think of uh, holding up a pelt that's bloody and um, sharing it on Twitter or Facebook. Mm -hmm. But w the other side of that that we don't see, and sometimes there are people for whom that's, that is the way it is. But... The, what you have described mm -hmm. does exist. Yeah, of course it like, does. And, and this is one of the, this again is one of the unfortunate things I think about the, the hunting community is that there hasn't been an acceptance that there are actually horrible people <laughs> within the community. I see. But like kind of, are, you want to like wash the whole community yeah. and say, we're all just fundamentally interested in but conservation. It's, but it's ridiculous. Yeah. It's silly. But to, it, to suggest that. But the idea is, does it matter? Because whether well, that's this person's a great question. individual yeah. motivation is shit, mm. is the $60,000 that he's contributing mm. to kill that lion going to such a fundamentally important cause when it would take how many? How many photographic tourists? Mm. To, well, we saw some of those numbers today. Yeah, to infuse. I think I actually took a picture a to infuse the same amount of money into the economy. Um, let me look at my photos here because, yeah, that one was quite striking to me. Um, well, that's the comparison that's always made. Um, 
is that we can replace it with photographic tourism. Yeah. So, so here this image says um, privately owned protected area. So specifically talking about those regions, uh, photographic tourists, there are 24,000 in, in wherever in a certain amount of time in this one region. Yeah, it was in South Africa. Some, oh, actually, I know that was the t that was, they were referring to Timbavati, which is a private reserve on the edge of Kruger National Park. Okay. 24,000 photographic tourists making up 17% of the total income. Only 54 hunters. So 24,000 to 54, making up 61% of the total income. Yeah. It's crazy. And you think about the footprint. Well, that's the ecological the footprint, thing, yeah, of, of those people. 54 people coming in and infusing that much money and hunting animals that in many cases, not all, but in many cases would need to be removed anyway. Well, certainly there. It's mm. all part of a very stringent... I've actually been to Timbavati by coincidence. Mm. It was one of my... So certainly there, it, it's under, you know, very strict control. And they are only... You've got to remember that where you have ethical concern, mm -hmm. which is most, not all, but the vast majority, and even without that, a long-term view to your business, if your business is hunting, you're not going to want to do anything to that, that environment or population of species that you're hunting that is going to be detrimental to it. Yeah, you want to be able to continue it. to hunt them. Yeah. yeah. There, there, is a, there is a huge incentive to do your absolute utmost to make sure that that population is in the best health it can be, not just for today, but for the next generation, if you're passing on your business to your kids. But again, going back to, and this has many tentacles, um, uh, going back to the image that we opened up with mm -hmm. of the kind of bastard hunter, he may not give a shit. Yeah. He may be only thinking about himself and he may be only thinking about the next kill. And he may not be thinking about, in any respects, about the larger web that his actions are a part of. Mm. But does it matter if he is used yeah. as a tool for conservation, whether he is in on that or not? And, and so just I want uh, to mention a couple of more statistics from one of the presentations today. Money that one hunter, so this is basically the translation of those numbers that I gave you. Money that one hunter brings into the region is equivalent to 1,600 times that of a photographic tourist. Crazy. And the environmental footprint, like we said, of the photographic tourism is much higher. And one thing that we didn't mention is that many of these regions that hunters will go to stalk and, and kill an animal are, are just not regions that a photographic tourist would be willing to step foot in because they're not beautiful. They're quite um, uh, difficult. There's no expensive lodge. To to. They're expensive. Yeah. There's no lodge nearby. You know, you may have to hunt or I'm sorry, you may have to um, camp. Mm -hmm. You may have to, you may not be able to shower for a few days and that might just might not be something that somebody on vacation wants to do wants to be a part of yet those areas still require stewardship and those areas still require an infusion of funds i always think it's important to ask yourself what happens in the vacuum mm -hmm. as something i mentioned in the symposium is that there, there is really very little land that isn't utilized by someone for something right now so if you, and it doesn't even have to be hunting that we're talking about, if you remove whatever the land use is now, as it stands, what replaces it? Now, in some instances, that might be a very positive change. You know, it could be uh, intensive cattle farming, and you remove that and you turn it into an ecotourism area, and now you get the bush back, you get the wildlife back, and that could be, you know... That could be positive. But in an area where it, uh, tourists don't want to go and it's a hunting concession and it's funded in that way, what happens if tomorrow that shuts down? What replaces it? There are still rural communities, very rural communities in some instances, instances living in those areas. Yeah. So but we think of it like these indigenous something. tribes yeah. are living in these very remote regions. And they will utilize the environment around them understandably as they yeah as they i mean many of us would believe should have every right to do yeah but with the situation of the, the hunting concessions they're able to uh benefit from the utilizing uh, utilization of the wildlife in a sustainable manner and, and one that is key. um regulated when it is regulated yeah 100%. Mm, yeah and and what your point about 
does it matter the reason that somebody hunts? It, funny enough, that is the conclusion that I, and the, actually the phrasing that I very often use when I'm having debates. Um, or I, I, I certainly did use it. I've, I've come to question it a little bit. Uh, and I, I formed that same argument. As long as the greater conservation consequences for hunting taking place in an area, and we're normally when I'm having these discussions, it is uh, over some sort of emotional uh, emotional animal, like, a, like an elephant or a lion, mm-hmm. uh, because that's what most people get up in arms about. Few people are that worried about a deer being killed. Yeah, um, is just understand the the economic benefits to the area, and the fact that there's hunting there means that they can pay for anti poaching patrols, and it's good for the environment. Trust me, it is. Uh, it doesn't matter that that guy's a complete dick mm-hmm. because <laughs> I think he is too. Uh, because you're right, he doesn't care. All he wants to do, go and do is put something on his wall and show all his mates when he gets home. But it doesn't matter because he is still shooting the right animal under the stewardship of the professional hunter and under uh, the correct regulation and licenses from the government. So it shouldn't matter. The reality of the world that we live in is that it kind of does matter because that is... In many people's eyes, it's the only thing that matters. Yeah, it is. Which is... I think it's it's a little ma- narrow minded to think that that is the only thing that matters because it's not looking at the bigger picture. But I totally understand it, and it was actually Shane Mahoney that picked me up on this when I, I asked yeah. him the question in an interview I did with him maybe a year ago, uh, and I posed exactly the same question to him, uh, phrased in the same way. I said, "Does it matter the moral reasons why someone wants to kill something if the consequences are positive for the environment and the wildlife?" And he said, it "Absolutely, does matter, and it matters because as we see time and time again." It is those that moral exception that the, the wider public take that actually have downstream effects, and it's it's that that ends up shutting hunting areas down because people can't wrap their heads around the idea that somebody would want to do it. Because there's an outcry, oftentimes from the West, and so much political pressure and capital comes into the conversation that regions are actually pressured into changing the laws. Yeah, and that's what happened in Botswana. The unfortunate thing is that, I mean, I was literally about to say before I made that statement, that kind of summary statement, that unfortunately we can't really legislate morality. We can only legislate practicality, Mm -hmm. but we do see moral conviction leading to legislation quite often. The thing is that hunter who's a dick, who is a problem because he's a PR problem more than anything else. Mm -hmm. We cannot force him to do it for the right reasons. And we can't have some sort of morality test to decide who gets to hold the gun. At the end of the day, that animal is going to die. If you you accept the, the management principles that we've been talking about, which is the reality on the ground, someone is going to shoot that animal because of all the reasons that we've discussed. As long as it's done in an ethical manner where the minimal suffering occurs to the animal, which most responsible people would do, and even if the guy's a bit of a knob, you would hope that, well, he, he would have to because he's, <laughs> he's not by there by himself. He's being guided. So he's not going to be allowed to, uh, it's, it's not a free for all. Because let's be clear, if he were there by himself shooting what he wanted to shoot without regulation, without well, permits, poaching. he's a fucking poacher. Yeah. And yeah, that's that's different. That's illegal. That's illegal, and it's highly punishable. Yeah. And it's something that, across the board, whether you're a hunter, whether you're a government official, whether you're an indigenous person, we're not okay with. No. Poaching is not okay. And I think it it's maybe something that we didn't say early on, that yeah, we didn't I, make a clear distinction. We are talking about legal hunting that's done for conservation and sustainability purposes. Yeah. Hunting and poaching are two different things. Very different things. When it is done legally, it is not always hunting. It could be culling. And we can flesh that out. Yeah. But when it's done illegally, it is only one thing. And that is poaching. And, the and question, that is in the same bucket as rhino horn poaching, as yeah. ivory poaching, as pangolin, which aren't, is not even a species you hunt. But whether that flesh is consumed... Or that horn is sawn, uh, that horn is sawed off, and that carcass is left to die. If it's done illegally, it's still poaching. Still poaching. And I think this is a hard truth 
even for me to come to grips with that it, if in a local community that's hungry and that has excessive wildlife that's become a burden, if they don't have the permits and they've not worked out with the local authorities a legal way to kill that animal, that's poaching too. It is, yeah. And in Central Africa, meat poaching. Mm -hmm. So we're not talking about extra products like ivory or, or rhino horn. Meat poaching is one of the biggest problems. And it's f from uh, hungry people. Well, let me qualify that. It's largely by hungry people, but there is also an element of it that they're doing it for vast profit. Absolutely. Because they are, they are mass poaching meat and then selling it in markets. But so I also there, think there it's, it's, there's also a big difference. And, you know, this is, it, it comes back to this moral question. I'm going a little off, off um, out of left field here, but I promise we'll come back. It comes back to this fundamental question, uh, this moral kind of thought experiment that is it stealing if, if you're doing it to feed your family. Mm. Um, but also, is there really a fundamental difference between somebody killing an animal because their family is hungry to give them food or somebody killing an animal to make the money that they need to feed their family? Yeah. Because they're selling Where do you draw the line? How much money is too much money? Well, and it really becomes this conversation that I think we've seen quite often in the West, um, especially in the United States, about drug trafficking and that we have a long historic... Um, law enforcement problem of going after the vulnerable people who are selling small quantities of drugs in order to make a living because they don't have any other options and treating them the same as a, a trafficking kingpin who's actually, you know, moving in pounds and pounds, kilos and kilos of drugs, who has an armed militia behind them and who is making, um, uh, incredibly immoral decisions and yet somehow they're treated the same way. Mm -hmm. And so I think with the poaching problem, and this is not what this episode is about, and maybe we'll be able to get into this in another episode, but there is also a difference. And we talked to an anti poacher, uh, a poach, um, an anti poaching, what do you call him? I mean, well, he was, like yeah, a, he was like the head of an anti-poaching unit. Yeah, yeah, I mean, he was like a like a. He was a tough dude. He was a tough dude, <laughs> um, and he, and he was so sensitive and so empathic to the idea really that was. the guy on the ground mm -hmm. is not the same as the trafficker who's bringing this meat to a warlord or who's bringing this horn across into China for, for traditional Chinese medicine purposes yeah. or, or whatever purposes. So, I mean, th I think we should be clear on that, but also that's not really the core conversation that we're having right now. No, yeah, that's a whole podcast by itself. <laughs> Absolutely. But it does speak to what I said before we broke for the break, which is that there is a fundamental human rights issue that I think often becomes lost in the conversation. And I'm not now talking about poaching, but I am... I am now talking about the idea that it's very easy, again, sitting in your air conditioned um, apartment in the West and eating your, you know, dollar ninety nine hamburger to say, well, how could these indigenous people possibly be comfortable killing an elephant yeah, or allowing because they probably wouldn't be if we we're talking about the hunting scenario. Absolutely. There are I suppose they would be seen as complicit by allowing it to allowing happen. it to happen. And how dare they, you know, like this, there's this, this indignant attitude that you see quite often because we use the word a lot. An elephant is a romantic animal. And, you know, Jason Goldman, that's who we've been referencing, who's been on the show several times, so you know, him by now, um, he made such a, an insightful comment that his, his two and a half year old niece can name an elephant and a lion and, um, I don't know, a, a rhinoceros long before she can name local California like wildlife. White tail or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but when it really comes down to it, I think that what the mistake that's often made when we talk about placing value on a life is that in the West, we sometimes put more value on the animal's life than on the human being that lives alongside it. And they're so, they're so linked, humans and wildlife. And that, that's the issue with uh, the sort of urban view that yeah. we have, is we are not really, we're no longer part of the environment anymore. Even though we are. Even though we are, <laughs> but we kind of right. we view it. You know, we view it at our window. We live in comfortable houses, and we have this two-dimensional view. Uh, as, and in the greater wild, sort of greater wilderness, it's through a television screen. Wild is something where we are not. Yeah, exactly. and it's something that's unspoiled by man, which is the most naive. Yeah, I mean, we have been 
carving out the landscape since for, for 200,000 years. I mean, th that's what human beings do. It's how we've existed. And whether we do it with concrete and, and irrigation or whether we do it with these very rudimentary fences mm -hmm. that we see, you know, we saw all over, all over the conservancy, um, people and wildlife coexist and they always have, and they always will. There is no, I think we have this romantic image that there are these vast swaths of land in Africa where people just never lived. And I think that's, you know, th that is probably one of the most important, important aspects of this conversation is that human beings have impacted the planet so much now that the most irresponsible thing that we can do is what many people suggest, which is leave it alone. <laughs> yeah, because we have to manage it. We have to, because the, uh, the alternative is so drastic, drastically negative, that I don't even want to comprehend it. And, and, and most people don't really follow it through all the way. So they say, so like the elephant issues, like, well, they were fine before. Yeah, well, they were fine before, but the, now we have countries. We have countries with fences and borders. And the migration routes of a, a lot of the elephants, you know, spanned multiple countries in Africa. Guess what? M a lot of the African countries are in conflict. So they, elephants are not stupid. They avoid conflict zones if they, can, if they can manage it. So their migration routes are not the same as they used to be. There's loads of cattle farms everywhere. There's agriculture everywhere. To, su to su suggest that it can go back to the way it was and we can allow wildlife to balance itself doesn't work in a landscape where the humans are still there. And that's the entire landscape. And that's the thing that's so important to remember because you, you mentioned they were fine before. Before fucking what? what? Yeah. yeah, like... Where are as you long starting? as we've known of them, they weren't <laughs> fine because we were involved in yeah. their lives. And human beings, unfortunately, are destructive. And yes, we can point to the existence of indigenous cultures around the world who had respect for wildlife and who managed to live harmoniously with wildlife. But they were small populations of people. Absolutely. And these were pre-colonial areas. And I mean, we saw it in the United States and we have much to learn from Native American populations in the United States. And I think that we, it's imperative that we actually do listen to the lessons that they can teach us about how they've been stewards of the environment. But even there, relationship with wildlife was a relationship. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a, I'll stay here and you stay there and nary, you know, <laughs> shall we meet? Yeah. Very often we don't share a relationship with wildlife anymore. Mm -hmm. And if we did, I think we'd be looking at a very different landscape. I think we would understand it better. One of the conclusions that I've come to increasingly is that one of the most environmentally responsible things that we can do is to utilize our wildlife and resources. But, it should be without saying, it has to be in a sustainable manner. And I'd even go uh, further than that, that what we should be striving for is not actually sustainability, but it should be an improvement in the populations and the environment that they live in. Yeah. We started talking about, I'm not quite sure when sustainability became the buzzword, but I mean, it's, I think it's pretty much been within my lifetime, so maybe 15, 20 years. Sustainability is now the default position, or it bloody well should be, <laughs> because why would we be taking any action in any aspect of, of industry or hunting or development uh, that doesn't uh, look at the sustainability of the environment that it's happening in? I don't think we can support something that isn't sustainable. Yeah. So the next step is to say, well, what more can we do? And we do need to write you know, some of the, the catastrophes that have happened in terms of an environmental uh, and wildlife management of the past, as indeed you guys have done in North America. You know, your market, uh, market hunting, which was not a recreational hunting, it was basically just hunting for food, uh, mass culling and slaughtering of food, actually, of the wildlife, was seen as, uh, it was seen as an, uh, an unexhaustible resource. Absolutely, yeah. And guess what it was? Yeah. Just and like, you nearly lost all of it. Just like oil has yeah. become across the globe. But you fixed it. Yeah. It was realized in the early 1900s. It was realized, and without going into the masses of details, you know, that became the North American model of conservation because it was a realization that, yeah, we've nearly lost everything. 
you know, there was the, uh, only a few hundred bison left. I mean, that's crazy mm-hmm. to think that that's how far it went before someone realized that they had I to do know. something about it. Our surveying techniques weren't very yeah. good back then. <laughs> but I, I think it serves as a, a really great case study that we are capable of facilitating a far better future. Yeah. If you think how far North America came in their conservation of so your conservation, <laughs> it's because it's your country, just like it is everyone who lives there, your conservation of the species, it's remarkable. Yeah. It, you know, it's something that I hold up as a, a brilliant example of what can happen when people work together. And hunting plays a massive role in the North American model. And that's not to say, and this is a mistake people make, I think, all the time, that is not to say that Oh well, it's work there. It's going to work somewhere else, but we can yeah, still under, we adapted. can still learn from the principles yeah. of it. It's not to say that the exact model is you can't relocate that to Namibia or South Africa or even Scotland because there are different places with different cultures, different people, and bigger different or smaller wildlife. landscape, and different yeah. wildlife. But we can we can learn from the successes of it. Mm. So we can make a difference if we're prepared to work together, and that was the key in North America was this reaching across the aisle and working together for a common goal, even if maybe people didn't necessarily agree with the methods, the outcome was the positive outcome they wanted. You're making people cry in their cars right now because they're (laughs) thinking about the political landscape in North America or in specifically in the United States currently. And, you know, that becomes the real question, doesn't it? Two things, you know, you talked about how it shouldn't just be about stopping the hemorrhaging at this point. It should be about kind of um, improving. But also we we have to accept that there's going to be a new normal. And I think sometimes we spend so much time lamenting w- how f- far it's gotten mm. that we forget that we can still get to a place that's okay even if it's never going to be brilliant. We um, can't turn the clock back. No. But we can learn from the past. Absolutely. We can't ever. And the thing is, people always want to talk about getting back to where we were, but that's what, when there were 3 billion people on the planet? Well, I'm sorry. We don't have the habitat that we used to have. Right. And I mean, it, it's a larger conversation that we can have about problems of population control. It's a completely different conversation. But the truth of the matter is that we live in the world that we live in right now. And I think it's hard for people to accept that. They want to often say, but what if, but I'm sorry, it just isn't. Mm. So what we have to do is come up with solutions now. And I think this, the central thing that you mentioned was that we have to be able to work together. And what we're saying here is NGOs, governments, local people, And yes, the hunting community, but so many people are so polarized by the emotional reaction that they have to hunting that they actually cause environmental damage at the scale. I mean, the best example for my listeners, if if I know my audience um, as well as I think I do, the best metaphor that I can come to is the idea of of golden rice and and how Greenpeace completely shat all over it and millions of people potentially died because the GM technology that could have fed a population that was absolutely in famine was cock-blocked because environmentalists could not understand how important this was. They were they were fundamentally hung up on the 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 technology mm. and they didn't like the idea of genetic modification. And I think that this is a very similar conversation. They're having an emotional reaction to something that's fundamentally necessary because it doesn't sit well with them more. Just because you don't like something doesn't make it wrong. Yeah. And, and just because you can't look at something out of context. No. You just and, and also the, as you said, the, the emotional aspect of it, it really muddies the water. And I, I do, however, on the other hand, think emotion is important because I think emotion rallies people. It makes you uh, react and do good and bad things. But when we're making decisions on a landscape level for conservation, for the environment, and at a species level for animals, we can't really let emotion dictate those decisions. 
because it, we need science. We need the facts. Bullshit shouldn't be part of the story. Like, to the best of our knowledge and with the information that we can obtain, what is the best route forward? And emotion will sometimes steer that in the opposite direction. And I mean, it's a conversation that we always come back to on this show. It's a conversation that we often talk about on my uh, my other podcast, The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe, is, is this conversation about evidence-based or evidence-informed legislation. We're not great at it in the States. I don't think we're great at it in other parts of the world. There are some parts of the world that are very good at evidence-informed legislation. Um, but, 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 but... If there's anything that working as a psychologist over um, or uh, as a, ther- a psychotherapist, I apologize, I'm not a psychologist yet, over the years um, has has taught me, it's that we can't decouple emotion from the legislative process mm. as much as we'd love to and as much as we think we should be able to. The people who are making these decisions are still people and those people are driven by their feelings. And so... Instead of, I think, steering, I use this metaphor. I don't think anybody really felt it in the room, but I use this metaphor <laughs> the, was other this the other day, day in, the in the symposium. <laughs> that when you're driving and you hit a patch of ice, your first instinct is to turn the wheel against it. And that's most likely going to cause an accident. But if you just kind of steer into the slippage, you know, and understand that the emotional conversation is always going to be a part of the conversation. So let's use it to our advantage instead of fighting against it. I think that we will be more effective in our rallying, you know, and in our efforts to actually, like you said, utilize all the voices and and ensure that all the voices in the room are heard and and that we can come up with maybe not the perfect solution, unfortunately, but maybe one that's good enough. Yeah. We can always strive to be better. And I'm, you know, I'm not going to sit here as someone who enjoys hunting because I do enjoy hunting uh, and suggest that that is the answer to every wildlife solution because it's not. But we need to find a way to ha- have a conversation where people can accept that it's important. And it's not just in Africa. You know, there's lots of countries around the world that utilize it really responsibly. And just to tie into what I was just saying about environmental responsibility, you know, we live at a time where our impact on the planet through how we consume is becoming more and more obvious in terms of our negative impacts mm-hmm. through increasing populations needing more agriculture. We can utilize wildlife in a responsible manner. And I think it is the responsible thing to do environmentally because guess what? The wildlife actually belongs there. Yeah. So if we are replacing uh, the wildlife and an ecosystem with something that we have reconstructed now, so we turn it into a cattle farm or we plow it up and uh, plant a crop in it, it is not going to be as sympathetic to that landscape as sustainably harvesting a wild source of food. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about game here. I think in that way, if people can come around to it in that kind of understanding where they can feel that they're really making the right choice, even if they don't want to go and partake in it themselves, but as long as they understand that this sort of uh, harvestable surplus that can be obtained, obtained from good management of an area is something that can help us have less impact on the planet then I think we would go some way towards making people feel a little bit more comfortable. I think that's a good point that you're making that, you know, again, hunting's not the answer to every conservation problem. And you don't have to be a hunter no. to be a part of the solution. Do you know what? I think I, I think somewhat the, the, the issue in one of the, probably one of the issues for North American listeners is that if you don't hunt, How do you consume actual wild meat? So you can consume a bison, which is a wild animal, but it'll be farmed. Mm 
yeah. unless you've sourced it from somebody who hunts or you've hunted it yourself. Yeah, I so, don't think people even know that. Like, no. if you go to a, a kind of a place that sells quote unquote exotic meats, because most people in, in North America eat chicken, beef, and pork if they eat meat. Um, beyond that, they might have lamb once in a while. Very few people eat goat, um, you know, these domesticates. But if you're eating something in a restaurant that specializes in quote unquote exotic meat, mm. like a bison burger, that's not a wild bison that you're eating. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's still probably living in a in a wild-ish environment, but, but it it's is bred. farmed. It's bred, it, and it has for, to be. It's bred it's for legal. meat consumption, yeah. and that's because of the way that our laws are written. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, I don't think people know that. So, so, and I think that causes somewhat of a problem when we're talking about connecting an environmental responsibility of uh, managing and harvesting a surplus of wild game because you can't do it. <laughs> that's true. You so can. A, well, very, you can if you're a hunter. Yeah. But you have no way of accessing that in North America. But if I'm the kind of person who's like anti-gun and who just like doesn't really feel morally like I would be comfortable killing yeah. an animal. Um, but, you know, I, I kind of understand why other people do. It's such a foreign concept to me, all these things we're talking about, because there is no real model outside of hunting no. in the United States. So you need to befriend somebody who hunts so they can give you some <laughs> actual wild meat. Whereas it's very different to the situation we have at home, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the UK, where you can... You can go, you can even, you can, if you live close by so you can drive, you can literally drive to the estate and say to them, can I buy a carcass from you, please? So you don't, <laughs> and, and and that's what I do. And I actually, I've, I've done it for friends of mine who don't hunt. I, I have one friend of mine, uh, they used to be the neighbors to my parents and uh, um, Ralph, same name as my dad, actually, but uh, he, uh, his wife's a uh, vegetarian. Mm-hmm. And they, because he's just sort of fitting within uh, their lifestyle, he basically became a vegetarian as well, but he, he still ate meat, but there's no point cooking two meals, right? Flexitarian. Yeah. So he was, a, yeah, I suppose he was a flexitarian. <laughs> Semi-veg. Um, but for like 20 years or something like that, he didn't really eat any meat, mm -hmm. but now he does. Mm -hmm. So we've actually taken him out hunting and he shot his first pheasant uh, last season, which was great. And he was, it was so awesome to see this, uh, the kind of reaction on his face at the kind of the responsibility he had taken, he actually shared that meal with his dad, mm -hmm. which was which was awesome. Uh, but the, but the reason that I I tell that story is that there's a guy where with with that exception, he is now consuming in his household uh, wild meat, but he didn't have to go and actually hunt it himself. Yeah. So we went to the I organized from the local estate for him that him and a couple of other friends who actually they they do hunt but they don't stalk deer they don't have rifle uh, they don't have center fire rifles that you need to go and stalk deer they just shoot shotguns what are all the words you just said i'll, I'll come back to okay it. i'll come back to it so i'll finish the story first and then okay. i'll explain what i just said but they so they don't hunt deer although they do do other forms of hunting but they're able to go to the, the local estate and go and buy a carcass and then take it home, butcher it up, put it in the freezer. It's just so appetizing when you call it a carcass. Carcass. It's a, <laughs> you can either buy it with its skin on oh, or Jesus with its Christ. skin off. Yeah. yeah. It's but, <laughs> so foreign to me, which is hilarious because I did, like I said, I grew up, I have an image burned into my brain of a, a deer with its throat cut, bleeding out, hanging from a tree, yeah. which is what we would do, you know, and my father giving us an anatomy lesson on my grandfather's workbench, opening up the deer stomach to show us what it ate <laughs> and feeding its eyeballs to the dogs. I really? remember this, and I actually remember it quite fondly. I've never fed eyeballs to my dogs. You didn't? <laughs> no, I can't say I've ever done that. No. Oh, yeah, my dad always did that. Yeah. I don't know why. Um, but... Yeah, it's it's so funny because now living in, you know, my kind of sanitary house in Los Angeles and Yeah, what's the what's your norm? Uh, and we we have people What's my norm is like Whole yeah. Foods. <laughs> and we have uh, so I'm Whole Foods actually sells game, at, you know. Really? I think so, but of course it's all farm game. Yeah, yeah but it's I mean, before I uh, before I got my own house in my early 20s or whenever it was. Uh, and I was staying at my folks' place between going to university and what have you. I was always out hunting, and we always had, especially during the well, during the game season. By game season, I mean the bird season, um, because you can actually hunt something all year round in the UK. Mm -hmm. uh, there would invariably on a weekend be something hanging up in the garage. Mm -hmm. But the kind of uh, throughput of people who come and visit you, just you know, in a normal day to day life, 
you know, very few of those would have been hunting, you know, my mom's friends or, you know, whoever it might be, but they always saw stuff hanging up yeah. and it was never a problem. It was never a problem because they were very uh, clearly able to see the connection and they would be the, you know, the same people who would occasionally come around for dinner mm -hmm. and we would serve venison. Yeah. And hey, it's, oh yeah, I remember I was here three months ago and there was, I saw some deer swinging outside uh, as they were, uh, you know, curing for, uh, well, we just call it hanging, but essentially just curing the meat yeah. um, for two, two, two weeks, say, depending on the temperatures outside, or if you've got a refrigerated unit, you can control it better. And so those connections were slowly built over time. So pretty much anybody who comes into our household knows and has seen it. Mm -hmm. And let's be clear, like, before probably World War II, this is how everybody lived. Yeah. I mean... This was not abnormal. Yeah, before you had, you know, Wonder Bread and... <laughs> What's Wonder Bread? Oh, you don't know Wonder Bread. So I'm trying to think of, like, classic <laughs> processed food labels that have been around since kind of the mid-century. Yeah. Um, yeah, before we had, you know, Twinkies and Wonder Bread. I know and, Twinkies. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, Campbell's Soup and, and all of these things... People made their own food. Yeah. And had their own vegetable patches. Absolutely. They had, in the but you look at some of the old butcher shop pictures in mm -hmm. the UK, and I'm sure it's probably the same in the States. You would see the game hanging up outside with its fur on. Yeah. Rabbits, pheasant, partridges. Uh, you, but they, probably, they, would, they wouldn't hide the back room. You, you would see all the carcasses lined yeah. up, not not just game, but uh, you know agricultural you know, livestock as well. Oh, now you have to go to Chinatown <laughs> if you want to actually see the animal in its form. Yeah, it's true; it it's still culturally there, and in, in, you know, obviously in many parts of the world. Um, but we have become, and I guess this is taking us full circle. Also, I don't want to make us late for our dinner reservations, um, but this is um, we have become very distant from the source of our food. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's probably one of the reasons that these also very distant places, which don't feel so distant to me now, being here and seeing it in person, it's um, incredibly illuminating having the opportunity that not everybody has, you know, not everybody economically has the opportunity to visit these places. And the only time they'll ever be able to experience them is by watching a National Geographic documentary. But... I think that we have to have the humility to remind ourselves on a regular basis that the way that we live is not the way that everybody lives. And what we think is best is not always what's best. It's often not what's best because we've not been there and we don't fucking know. Yeah. You don't, we don't always have the information yeah. to make the best decisions. So and I didn't even explain center fire rifles. <laughs> <laughs> At least now I know you said center fire. Oh, sorry, was I not right? speaking clearly? <laughs> no, you're my British you're, accent. You absolutely speak <laughs> clearly. We have different accents, and it sounded a bit like you said centified. Uh, no, center fire. Like, it's like like roses, maybe or jasmine. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. I do want to bring things back around to, to the beginning of the conversation before we close out, because we opened up talking about your work as a filmmaker. Yeah. Um, Which we a, haven't talked about at right? all. Right? <laughs> with a very strong conservation focus. We, talk, we also t mentioned that you personally are a hunter. And we also talked about the work that you were doing with the pangolins. And so I thought maybe we could take a few more minutes to, um, to talk about all those things so people can meet you a little bit better. So, uh, well, just to wrap up the, the pangolin story and, to, if nothing else, to raise awareness of it. As I said at the start, they are the most trafficked mammal in the world. And they're trafficked. So, so by now, maybe you've looked at a pangolin, but this is something that's like within, a scaly dog. Yeah, but it's like within the anteater family, yeah, right? Is, yeah, yeah. Um, or the aardvark. Yeah family or maybe even i don't know if it, echidnas or echidnas i can never fucking say that word Do you know what that is um they're australian right okay. and they're kind of like they look like weird hedgehogs with long I'll take noses your word for it. yeah yeah but um the the pangolin is such a funny facultative quadruped like it walks on its hind legs a lot yeah. it has these massive keratin scales and that's what they're trafficked for exactly so it's exactly the same material as a rhino horn gotcha same thing and this all kind of comes down to 
<laughs> we're looking at each other smiling. It comes, <laughs> it comes down to uh, boner pills yeah, in China. That's what it is. Yeah. <laughs> as, as we as we were joking in the plane the other day, maybe we should just mass drop Viagra across the that entire part of the world. Yeah, but just put it in the water. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, or put it in the water. Yeah. But it, it, I think there there are some other uses for it. But essentially, it's the same material. Mm. You know, it's kept in. It's your fingernails. And these are such. I mean unique and they're incredible just i nearly cried when i saw one did you 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 held one you had to carry one so um the hospital for them uh, they call it the hospital it's like the rehabilitation center is in johannesburg or it's near johannesburg and what happens when they they do a lot of sting operations they're involved in a lot of sting operations so when they confiscate a pangolin uh, they take it to the rehabilitation from a center. poacher. From a poacher, yeah. normally through a tip. It could be someone who's deliberately gone and poached it. It could be somebody who's just come by it. I mean, sometimes they get a phone call say, "I've found this thing." Yeah. Uh, but more often than not, it is uh, deliberate poaching of it. Or they find it in luggage at an airport, or they. Find, I mean, you hear these. They crazy found one on just the story. side of the road, that, oh. but it was in town, so it definitely didn't get there by itself. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, so they, they go to the rehabilitation center, they, the vet checks them out, they work out if they're damaged, which very often they are because they're pretty abusive to them because they don't need to be alive. Yeah, they just need the scales. They just need the scales. So what they do is they like squash them and dry them and stick them in a container. There was 42 tons. A pangolin weighs between 50... These pangolin we're talking about, the Terek pangolin... Um, they weigh about 15 to 25 kilos. Uh, and they found 42 tons of them in a container in February. Um, yeah. So they, they go to the rehabilitation center, they check them out, and then they go through the process of rehab, which could be fixing wounds to start with. Uh, but then they have to feed them. Now, the interesting thing about them is that you can't really, apart from with a tube, you can't artificially feed them unless you literally go and scoop up uh, an ant heap and put it in the cage with them. Because they have these weird tongues. Yeah, and that's they how need they to eat. like f- stick their tongue down the hole um, where the ants live and scoop out the ants and larva is what they prefer. Mm. Uh, they don't really, from my understanding of the conversations that I had, I'm, I hope I don't want to come across as an expert, and this is just the knowledge that's been imparted on me. Uh, is that they don't really like termites, mm. uh, unlike an aardvark. Um, so they have to go walk them. They lit- literally, there is uh, volunteers and people who work within the, well, actually, they're all volunteers, within the uh, African Pangolin Working Group, and they go and walk these pangolin in Do this. Do they have leashes? No, no leash. <laughs> but you just have to monitor them. So you, I mean, they're not that fast. So you just walk around with them uh, for like, four or five hours a day so that they can eat in this uh, undisclosed area uh, that they use. And they had, uh, a couple of weeks ago, they had four in the hostel. So do the maths on that. Yeah. That's like walking, uh, that's walking pangolin for an entire day. <laughs> so it's massively, massively intensive. And that's yeah. how I had the opportunity to hold one. Yeah. Was that there was this young pangolin that they were walking and you had to take it from its crate to the area. And then once it finished eating, take, pick it up again and put it back in its crate to take it back to the hostel. And are they aggressive or are they just like, <laughs> I'm no, chill to do this right now? The... An older one that has been abused might not be that fond of picking up. And actually, they can be quite reactive to male voices because it tends to be males that are doing the poaching. Oh, that's so sad. Um, but of course, this is probably why it's so easy. I mean, they're elusive, like you said, but it's so easy, unfortunately, to poach them. is because they're easy. like, sure, I'll come yeah, along you with just, you. Just pick them up. <sighs> and that's the sad reality of it. Uh, but this little guy was, uh, he hadn't really been abused um so he was he was very calm and chilled out and i just i arrived there the the, the professor of of the the working group took me there and uh, to see them and because afterwards i was going up to actually do a release with uh, one of his team and i sat down i had my camera in my hand and i sat down in the dirt uh, in the bush with like thorn trees above me and he, he was actually already he was already out he'd been taken out and he was like snuffling, and they make this like little piggy snuffling noise as they they're trying to. I assume it's because as they're trying to scent, they're trying to find the right place to go and mm-hmm. stick their tongue down to go and get the juiciest eggs. And I couldn't say anything for like twenty seconds. I'm sitting there, and I can feel. I actually, I can feel it now. <sighs> I could feel this emotion that I wasn't expecting to feel because I by that point I knew quite a lot about them because we'd spent two months raising money to buy thermal and camera traps so that for the for conservation efforts 
Um, and I had no expectation that I was going to feel like that when I sat down. And I, I'm not sure, I, I still can't quite work out why. I, I, and the best that I can come to is because I was so acutely aware of the difficulties they face as a species yeah. and the fact that if we don't change something, they're gone. When I spoke to Professor Janssen, he said, look, it's simple. If we don't do something, if we don't change the trend, in 20 years, there will be no pangolin left. That's it. Game over. Finished. And this is a species that many people listening are only hearing about for the first time right that's now. That's the crazy thing. Mm. That's the... And I think that's what made me sad. Yeah. But then, after that, then I started to enjoy this interaction with an animal that I would have never had the opportunity. And hopefully through like the podcast that we did with the, the guy, which actually just released yesterday with the guys on the ground and through some of the social media that we're doing and through articles, it's going to help increasingly raise awareness of the species. And then people will begin to care more and hopefully actually support the people who are doing good work. Yeah. So, so yeah, that was the pangolin uh, story. And then I, we went on and there was actually one that had finished rehab mm -hmm. and we were releasing it for the first time with uh, sat tags and um, uh, telemetry chips and stuff yeah. as well so that we could follow them. And that was another amazing experience because this was, this was a success. This was something that had been taken, uh, had been uh, retaken by the authorities, given to the African Pangolin Working Group gone through the rehab and now was going through this uh, soft release process where mm -hmm. it was literally being monitored on the ground every night yeah. and then for many, many weeks. And it was, uh, it was great to see they were working with a local farm up in the north of South Africa and um, the, the local farm manager, he, he had taken it upon himself to caretake for this pangolin yeah. and he'd never even seen one. That's amazing. Yeah. Because most people haven't. Because most people haven't. So where can people, people can hear the podcast that you did and where can they start to see some of the work that you do in, in filmmaking, in storytelling, mm -hmm. so that they can learn more about these conservation issues? So the best place uh, to find that, so for the podcast, if you just search Into the Wilderness on any podcast app, you'll pick it up. And the most recent one is all about Pangolin. Uh, so you'll have a, a better understanding if you listen to that. The chap we interviewed was Francois Mayer, and he is uh, studying for his master's and working with the Pangolin Working Group. Mm -hmm. the, the crazy thing speaking to him was that he, every, time, every now and then I'd ask him a question, because of my own intrigue, and it's like, you know what? No one knows. Like know, gestation crazy, period. Right? No one knows. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that's where people can find the podcast and the filmmaking stuff, which is very much centered around things like that. So I am going to be making a film about, mm -hmm. a short film about pangolin conservation in the same way that we may, we've made one about the plight of sea trout due to fish farms. Uh, we did one recently with uh, David Attenborough about the, well, he was kind enough to narrate it for us, about the plight of salmon globally, uh, so North America and over into Europe. And all of that can be found uh, on our website, which is paceproductionsuk.com. Uh, and the other goings on that we're involved in uh, between the podcast and the filmmaking and the hunting that we do, uh, that's all on our Instagram, Pace underscore Brothers. And we also actually have... Uh, Say that one more time. Pace underscore Brothers. P -A -C -E Pace underscore Brothers. Underscore Brothers. <laughs> and uh, the PaceBrothers.com is... Uh, basically where everything is. So the filmmaking stuff is within our production company, but all the other stuff that we do, um, because everything that I've been talking about, I do with my brother, but he doesn't happen to be here, which is why I haven't been referencing him, but he is the co-host of our podcast. So while we've been here, I've been doing like one intro, he's been recording the other intro. Of <laughs> uh, but that's all on the pacebrothers.com. Great. Well, Byron, you think you're off the hook, but you're not. Um, so d don't think that you could have... I'm getting hungry now. Yeah, I was going to say, don't <laughs> think you could have showered before uh, leaving for this dinner because you don't have time. <laughs> um, I, I have to ask you before we go, I close every podcast asking my guests the same two questions and like I get shit when I forget to do it. So um, I've got to make sure I do it with you okay. right now. And these are like big picture questions. Something tells I'm me you have big picture answers. <laughs> And we may even already know the answer, so they could just be summaries. Who knows? But when you think about the future and whatever context is relevant to you right now as we speak, um, that could be a, a very personal context or it could be a global one. Number one, what is the thing that does keep you up the most at night? The thing that maybe you're even borderline pessimistic, possibly even cynical about? The thing that you are just legitimately the most worried about? 
But on the flip side of that, I want to know what you are like genuinely optimistic about the thing that you're quite excited and that you aren't just paying lip service to, but you really are looking forward to. The thing that keeps me up at night, I think it's been compounded by spending the last month here in Africa, but it's on my mind all the time because I spend a lot of time here. But it's not just uh, it's not just related to Africa, but is the genuine loss of wildlife that we are seeing around the world. And alarming. it really, yeah, yeah. I mean, and just everything, rate. and it's such a it's such a massive topic mm-hmm. that it's hard to work out even where to start with that. But it was it was really brought home to me when I watched the first episode of Our Planet. Yeah, and the opening like ten minutes of that is just a list of all the loss of wildlife within my lifetime. Yeah, and you know, I don't know, I don't know if within the life that I have left, whether some of the species that I know very well, especially in an African context, when we're looking at threatened and endangered species like pangolin, which now has a special place in my heart, Mm -hmm. I don't know whether they're still going to exist. How much does that matter? And that's probably the thing that concerns me most is I don't know if people really stop to think about it. How much does that matter to you? And when you are so removed from it, when it is the other side of the world, it's not my problem. Yeah. It's not my issue. Yeah. It's, and then beyond that, uh, at home, we are, I almost don't want to use the word fighting, but it kind of feels like it. We are continually fighting within the hunting community. Sorry, not within the hunting community. The hunting community is continually fighting to keep the hunting practices that we have alive. Mm Mm-hmm. We could do an entire show on grouse management, but that is the uh, one of the hot topics. I still don't know what a grouse is. Um, <laughs> do you know what a quail is? Yes. Okay. It's like a big quail. Kind okay. of. That's so crude. But it's like a big quail. It's a bird. It's a game bird that's hunted. Uh-huh. And there is so... Uh, the management of our moorlands is so fragile and yet we are in such a precarious position with the continuation of the current management that we have due to outside forces largely supported by celebrities with fairly limited knowledge and a very clear agenda Mm -hmm. that they are changing government policy like at the click of a finger. While I've been in Africa, they revoked uh, general licenses, which was uh, an ability to control pest species without going into any more detail than that which at a time of year where every bird is breeding and all the farmers are growing their crops, we have so many endangered and red-listed bird species at home which rely on the control of these predators. And overnight, with a three days notice, Natural England revoked all its licenses yeah. on the back of p- public pressure with limited knowledge and not backed by science. That scares me. This we saw the same thing bad. in British Columbia with grizzly yeah. bears. This all sounds very bad. What are you? What are you hopeful about? Uh, give me, give me something good. I, I'm hopeful in the th- enthusiasm of my generation now, because I think that the more conversations I have and the more people I meet, like meeting you guys here, yourself and Jason, mm-hmm. out with the hunting community, I meet more and more who are willing to listen. And help me understand, as well as me help them understand, where a consensus can be formed for us to move forward in a way that wildlife and human beings can exist in the same environment, but in a way that is good for both, and where they both have a place. And that enthusiasm excites me because I've seen it. And those discussions which just keep going into the night. Like, I feel empowered after I have those discussions. And that, yeah, that for me is what keeps me going. Byron Pace, Pace Productions, Into the Wilderness, as you said. Thank you so much. This was um, incredibly illuminating. We talked for much longer than I usually talk to my (laughs) guests. So um, So thank you for having me on. And yeah, thank you for being here. Absolutely. I mean, it's it's more than a joy. Um, it's, it's kind of hard to put it into words, but, um, thank you. This has just been incredible. And everybody listening, thank you for coming back week after week. I'm really looking forward to the next time we all get together to talk nerdy.
Well, I hope you enjoyed that show. And now there's always a reason why you've got to hang around to the end, because then you get other cool stuff. Like, for example, do you like whiskey? And if you do like whiskey, go and get yourself a bottle. Now, to get yourself a bottle, you've got to follow a competition. And if you go on the Gallic Whiskies and Gins Instagram and Facebook page, there is a treasure hunt going on around Scotland. And uh, two bottles have already been found. And there's a third bottle out there. And I'm going to give you a hint. It's on the West Coast. Because Daryl dropped it off at the weekend. Because I just dropped it off. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, get yourself on there. And if you're going to be travelling to the west coast of Scotland anytime soon, um, I don't think this one's going to be far found as fast as the other one. I was impressed by the speed of, the speed of bottle of them. two. It, yeah, I was impressed with the speed. So, that I, unfortunately, off the top of my head, I can't remember the name of the gent who found it. Uh, but he uh, literally... I think it was later the d- uh, that day, day when the last clue went out. He took a picture he, of it. Yeah, and he said just we needed found. to find the narrower yeah. location. And he had been it. following it, and he'd, he'd worked it out. He knew exactly where it was going to be in terms of uh, the location, but just not where the little bottle was. So he was waiting for that final clue. So I'm glad it's been working out. Where the bottle location of the next one is, thousands of people go here a year, if, if not hundreds of thousands, pass through it every year. Um... It is, it's difficult to find, but the location, you know, you can get to it relatively easy and it, it comes with a good view. Let's put it that way. The, I'm just, have we already put, I've already put one clue out. I have put one yeah, clue one out. Yeah. out. So I'll have to put clue number two out today when this yeah. podcast goes out. Yeah. And that'll give you an even better idea. I'll help you out. It's under a rock. <laughs> Yes, just start overturning rocks yeah. in Scotland on the on West, West Coast. Coast. <laughs> <laughs> that narrows it down a lot. That should have been clue one. It's worth a, yeah, under a, rock. It's under worth a bottle of whiskey, so just start turning rocks. And it's bloody good whiskey too. Thank you to all of our Patreon supporters. And like we said, the link will be below on how you get involved on the action. Um, I believe that some of the, the Patreon cool gifts have been sent out. Uh, if they haven't, I'm going to be doing it um, before the end of this week. That's for the, the top tier stuff yep. uh, and uh, yeah thank you to everyone that else that listens and and t- does their awesome stuff yeah. which is contact us and message us and tag yeah, us and I, things one thing I'm going to try and do is we've had quite a few emails about just telling us interesting things recently yeah um, which I always save um, but I haven't mentioned them on the podcast so maybe the next one I might read some of those out just to share them with everyone no, we really do appreciate, and we I know we say it all the time, but we appreciate every every email, every message on Instagram, and we do encourage people to get in touch. So the email is podcast at paceproductionsuk.com. Instagram is pace underscore brothers. Those are the two best places to get hold of us, and we do read every single one. So even if it does take us a while to get Sometimes back to you. Sometimes it takes a few weeks. Yeah, it takes a few <laughs> weeks. We will have read it. It's just that we don't have time to respond, but we do appreciate every single one one uh and i was gonna say one other thing which no contact oh listening i need to find the name of it we're actually on a new a new listener i saw i saw we got uh, a, an email the other day from libson didn't we? I i'm gonna try and find it right now but we're on itunes yeah we're on spotify uh stitcher we're basically everywhere that you can podbean, listen to which is, uh, i've just seen an email there we're on podbean uh i'm trying to see I would be very surprised if there's a podcast app that you use that we are not on. And if there is, please let us know because we will fix that. Let us know if you're having any issues because we have in the past had uh, people contact us saying, help, we're not on my podcast app that you used to be on. Oh, there we are. We're now on radio.com plus pod X. Never heard of either. Never heard of either, but there we go. We're now on both because I checked the other day and uh, we'd already been automatically submitted to them. <laughs> there so, you go. So, winning. Uh, Any other details, it's thepacebrothers.com. And lastly, don't forget uh, to go and check out our new podcast partner, Modern Huntsman. Um, we spoke about them before. We've had Tyler as a guest on the podcast on two shows i think and he's actually been in podcasts helping us interview on many of the american podcasts that we did Uh, so you probably already know who he is Um, if you want to know more about what modern huntsman is go back and just find the the two podcasts that we did with him uh with tyler You'll, you'll find the very original one before the first issue had ever been printed as well 
and we'll give you more details about like the partnership and everything going forward on probably an extended podcast maybe with Tyler on it yep sounds good We're to me soon. join us again in two weeks time 